Welcome everyone. This is our Wednesday Wisdom where we go over tips, tricks, and information on band instrument repair. Today we're going to be going over part three of flute pad installation, open hole flute pad installation. In the last video we talked about the grommet preparation and setting the height of that. So mm -hmm. if you haven't watched that stream, go back and check out part two. And in part one, we also talk about uh, pad protrusion and some other elements of prepping the instrument for accepting an open hole flute pad. Uh, today, we're going to be going over installing the actual open hole flute pad as well as the shimming process. Um, so Leroy, in one and two, we talked about pad thickness. We talked yep. about protrusion as well as the grommet prep and the reassembly trick that you showed them to right. kind of keep this all organized. Yep. Let's also, uh, before we get started with the actual open hole pad installation and the shimming process, why don't we go over the tools that they're going to need for this job? Yeah, of course. So in front of me here, I have a plethora of coolness um, to kind of do, I'll say start to almost start to finish uh, everything you'd probably possibly need is uh, you need some screwdrivers to take the keys off and to put them back together, um, whether it be a regular torch or an air torch or both. Uh, you will need a set of calipers to check the thickness and diameter of your pads. Tweezers of some sort to hold the shims in small pieces and parts. You will need a regular pen and a Sharpie pen. We'll see why later. A little pair of scissors. I like these because they're small and they're spring-loaded. Uh, these are sewing scissors. So if you ever need to find these anywhere, that's what those are. Um, obviously pads. A sharp or a uh, pad pricking device of some sort. The... Let me get this off of the, the area here. So the grommet remover, which is the preferred method for removing the grommets out of here. It's very cool. It's got a nice little edge on here that goes very nicely underneath the grommet between the pad and the grommet. Uh, or you can use a pad slick with a little bit of a divot on there and then you can create your own um, little angle on there. This one is the preferred method though just because of how smooth and, and finished the surface is. Uh, the other tool we'll need is um, pad iron. This one's awesome because it's got two different sizes for the varying diameters of pads that you'll be using and seeing out there. Our flute tool, which has this little guy hidden in the handle. And then some form of hammer to use the open hole punch set. And either some clear fingernail polish or our very cool water soluble glue. This is awesome, it's easy to use. And if you don't wanna use this and you use the fingernail polish, I prefer, I recommend clear, but if you really wanna get wild and use like black, orange, I don't think we're gonna hold it against you. <laughs> whatever they have laying around. Yep, whatever they have laying around. If it's glitter in there, then there's glitter. Um, and then if for, the final, for a final um, testing of stuff, uh, the leak tester. Okay, cool. So those are the, some of the tools that we need. Um, why don't we go over uh, just the basic uh, pad installation sure. and the shimming process. We, we talked about how to punch a flute pad last time. Correct. So maybe we won't do that this one, but right. if, if you want to show them the basic elements of the pad punch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then we'll start into the, the padding process. Absolutely. So in this, in this cool little box is our open hole um, flute pad punch set. It's got four sizes that you can choose from. This is the, I'll say the guiding device that would go together with that. So you would put the pad inside of here, put that on top of it. And then what looks to be like an empty bullet shell is actually your punch. It's got a cool little uh, horseshoe spring on the top that basically stops it from going all the way through and then would punch the hole through the pad. The great thing about this particular one compared to some of the others on the market is that this, the, the way this is designed, the pad punch itself, the cutter part, actually does not make, come into contact with any sort of um, material, bench, anything. It's all left in the open. So it helps prevent the dulling of that cutting, of that cutting um, piece. Now, 
basically at that point, once you find out the diameter of the pad, and if you already don't have the pad punched, and you've punched it, you would basically have a pad that looks just like this. So what I've done already is I have removed the grommet from this key section. So I've taken the grommet off. This is the pad and the shim that was in that pad cup. If you look, before I took it out of there, I made a mark on the back of the shim so to line it up with the pad arm. And then I also made a mark on the back of the pad to mark it up with the pad arm. I was actually trying to shim this before to see if I could get it to work just as for another demonstration, but I did that so I knew which way to orient the pad when I was putting it back in the pad cup. So both of those marks are going to be so you can line it up with the, the arm that comes down that holds the pad cup. Right. So I'll fold this back. So those marks that I was showing you, so this is the pad arm in the back. This to basically to those marks will line up with this. Okay. So it'll eliminate any other weird variables. So when you have to take stuff apart and put it back together, it's more consistent when you're put it when you're trying to shim and put the um, the pad and stuff back together. So at this point, I have already actually measured the thickness of the new pad and the old pad, and it is pretty comparable and very similar. So to try to eliminate any weirdness or other thin possibilities or, or whatnot, I will actually use the shim that came out of there. I will put that back in the pad cup and I will line that mark up with the key arm in the back. And then this is a brand new pad. So I just kind of put a mark wherever, because at this point it really doesn't matter. There is no point of origin because it's brand new. So we can make our own point of origin. So I'll put the pad in there and then I will show you. So it is lined up with the key arm. I will move it over off to the left because it is a little bit off. So I will move that off to the left just a little bit. So it's lined up. And at this point, I've actually marked the grommet. It's hard to see it, but I did mark the grommet in the back as well. Same idea and the same reasoning to try to eliminate any weird variables that might cause weird like, like leaks or shadow leaks or anything weird in on the pad itself okay so i have actually also adjusted the height this this part here turns and you can actually adjust the height of how far this pushes down on the last on the last uh, time we did this in the part two we explained why and how to adjust the height of how far this goes down to the grommet and, the, and just to recap, the reason why is you don't want to push it down too far for two reasons. One, it'll dish the pad, and then you won't get a good seat area. The other thing is you could actually push the grommet down too far and actually damage it. So at this point, I'm going to just kind of basically just putting that through the bottom of the pad cup. I'm going to get this set and then I'll show you on the camera what I'm basically doing so and when you're saying dish you mean like there's going to be some sort of like concaveness right so the pad itself so I'll actually do a little bit of arts and crafts here so this is so say this is the, the pad cup I won't I won't put the chimney in there or actually I will so that's okay. the pad cup this will be your pad so if you push too hard on the, and I'm going to make this really, really exaggerated. If you push too hard on the grommet, your pad will look something like this, and it'll dish like this. It's okay. very, very exaggerated, but that's kind of what, what, it, what ended up happening. What you want to happen is I will put it right underneath of it. So we'll draw another little pad cup with another little widget sticking out of there. The chimney. Thank you. You're, you're helping me with words again today. I appreciate it. You'll basically want it as flat as possible while the grommet pushes down and, and holds that pad on there. Again, I know this is extremely exaggerated, but that's the idea of the dishing, of the dishing problem. Okay, cool. So we want to avoid, we want to avoid this one and we want to make sure our pads as flat as possible so this is so this is no no and this is and this is yes i can okay, okay.
So, um, but basically all you'll have to do to set that grommet in there is, so this will basically be on your bench and you'll basically just push this with either your thumb or index finger, whatever you feel the most comfortable with that you can actually can get a good, uh, good push with and just push that together and then the grommet will set in the pad cup. Um, I do not recommend uh, using a hammer or anything impacting uh, to set the grommet for a couple reasons. One, it kind of defeats the purpose of the tool and being set to a, to a certain thing because it'll actually probably press or flex in there. The other problem is, again, it'll push the grommet down too far. You'll dish the pad. You could possibly damage the grommet, and then you're having to go backwards with a lot of other issues. So now that we have the actual pad in place, uh, sometimes there'll be some wrinkles, and many times there'll be wrinkles just because of installing the pad. At that point, you'll want to pick up the, that handy-dandy flute pad iron. I have a cool little glass of water over here. Then just take it, dip it in there, get some water on it, get that a little bit wet, dry it off. Torch, you can use an air torch as well, but this is just a little bit faster. Super fast with the heat. Check it with your hand. And then quickly iron the pad, and that'll eliminate any wrinkles in the pad. And so if you're heating that up, I mean, you just did that for like a second. If you heat that right. up too much, you're doing the test with your hand. Right. Um, if the pad iron's too hot, what, what can happen to the pad? Um, well, I can actually demonstrate that for you if you'd like. Um, I will, this is always fun for me. So this is, this is actually a new pad as well. Um, it was, it's prepped to basically put, you put in the right hand. Um, it actually has been ironed, so all the, all the wrinkles are out of it. But if for some reason, I'll even, I'll even wet it. We'll do the same process. But if for some reason, I laid too much heat on there. You know, so we're gonna, we're just gonna, you know, do this and see how Rich's day has been doing. <laughs> right. And, you know, wonder what we're doing later tonight, this weekend. Yeah, for, for lunch. You know, so, okay, so we're real hot right now. So we'll bring this up here and I don't we know like if you heard, heard I don't know if you heard it or not, but what ends up happening and it's hard to see it, but what ends up happening is it gets so hot that it actually burns through the skin hmm. of the pad. Um, if it gets even hotter, you can actually burn through the skin and then actually burn the felt. So literally destroying the pad, not making it usable at all. So, so at that point, you'd have to just start completely over. Yep, you would have to remove that. You'd have to take the grommet off, take the pad out, reinstall a new thing, basically start from square one to put another pad in there again. Mm -hmm. So it's always good to test it. My, my philosophy is if you can't hold, if you can't hold this after throwing heat on there, on this part of your hand, because this is a little bit delicate as far, as far as your hand goes. If you can't hold it on there for like maybe like a second, a second or something like that without it actually burning you, it's too hot. Okay. So after we've ironed it and made that all nice and flat, Basically take your key section and then put it back on the instrument. Grab one of grab one of your handy dandy screwdrivers. If I can find the slot there. And then So this is we've installed the pad and the grommet. And so now we've got the key section on the body and we're gonna start the process of actually leveling the pad. So this is where we would start checking for leaks. Correct. And then potentially shimming if we need to. Correct. Nine times out of 10, and I know that sounds like a really high percentage, but it kind of is. Nine times out of 10, you'll have to put some sort of shim in any given pad at any point, whether it be a teeny tiny partial shim or a whole bunch all around. There are many times you can get lucky, but don't, don't count on it. Basically assume that you're going to have to do some sort of shimming. So at first glance, and the, fir the, 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 the steps of the process that I usually go through is visual first, so with the leak light. Um, then I will use leak light with a feeler gauge. 
And then my last, I'll be, the last thing of defense would be the leak tester to, to, to check at the, the last point. So we're gonna close that up. And then just to demonstration to show you, I have backed off the B flat key. So if I push this, you can see that that's not closing all the way. I did that because if this is making contact before this, or if it's really close, it is almost impossible to get a good reading on this particular pad. So backing that off, getting it out of the way is your best and easiest solution to get a good feel for where this is sealing on this, on this pad. Same thing with the F and the F sharp, just back that off with the right hand, same idea. Cool. So and now which pad are you, just for me, which pad did you just install? Which uh, is the new pad? I installed the A pad. Okay. So, where your finger's touching. So where my index finger is, this one right here, the one that's going up and down. Gotcha. That's the one I, that's the one I changed. Okay. And that's the one we're checking. Okay. So on visual inspection, doesn't look too bad. Again, it's hard to see what's on the camera here, but take my word for it, it doesn't look too bad at all. And now at this point, I'll take my feeler gauge and I'm basically going to go around the pad it's, and see where it's grabbing light, where it's grabbing heavy, and go from there. I'm not going to worry about the back so much at this point, just to kind of show you and demonstrate what we're talking about. So if you can see it, again, I'm not pushing any harder or any lighter when I'm going around. This is actually grabbing pretty good once I get to around... If I'm looking, if I'm thinking of this key as a, as a clock face, so this would be 12, this would be six. Okay. So if I get somewhere, so I'm getting somewhere in the ballpark of like four or five, it starts getting light and it's continuing to be light until I get to around seven or eight. So when you say light, you're, you're pulling on the feeler gauge itself mm -hmm. and as you pull, it feels like there's less, uh, or there's more give. Correct. It, like you could pull it out of there easily. Correct. Versus the other sections where it feels pretty firm or like locked in. Yep, exactly. That's a great way to explain it. Um, so at this point, um, we would take our Sharpie, crack the cap off, and then just to double check and make sure where it was light and where it was heavy, we will go around again and just go, okay, so in that area, just kind of visually see it, take the Sharpie and mark the top of the, top of the key. And then we'll go through that area again until it starts to catch. And we'll take our pen, we'll take our Sharpie again and we'll mark that area. Now at this point, you can do one of two things. You can either use experience to kind of guess the thickness of shim that you would need or have feeler gauges like this. This material thickness on the, on the tip here is uh, it's half thousandths of an inch thick. So it's super, super thin. Um, when I started doing shimming, I had about four or five different feeler gauges. I had half thousandths, I had one, two, three, and four thousandths. To basically get me an idea of how thick of a shim I would need to put in the area that feels light. Um, I recommend doing that to anybody, especially if they're starting out, because trying to guess is near near impossible without any experience, either visually or how it feels on the, the half thousand gauge. And you can check out musicmedic.com because I know that we have like a whole assortment of feeler gauge we, material. We do. And that, that'll work for, for your process exactly. Yep, and it's it's super helpful and it's it's a great it's a great way to eliminate any weirdnesses that you might think, oh, it's this, and you put in like maybe a two thousands, and all of a sudden it's like, holy Pete, I just put a boulder in there, and then you have to like take it out again. So at this point, it feels and looks, again for me, it feels like I'm gonna have to put a two thousand shim in there. So what you can do at this point is we're only doing one key.